a question for Simon. My name's Pauline McBride. Um, I'm a lawyer and I have a connection with the University of Glasgow. You raised a lot of broad questions, but I wanted to pick up on something you said almost in passing. You drew a distinction between open websites and open data. And I wonder if you could just elaborate on what kind of business model you had in mind or what the distinction was. Okay, yeah, thanks, Polly. Um, <clears throat> well, for us, if I can just, if I can just illustrate that from, from, from King's perspective, and hopefully that might speak to other people. Um, we've been building digital humanities resources for 20 years or more. We have over 105 different uh, humanities, uh, digital humanities resources. We have over 5 million digital objects in there, um, and we're an academic department. <laughs> and many of those resources were built um, at a time when the only way that you could build that resource was by making the interface so intrinsically related to the content that you couldn't take the architecture of the resource a a away from the content. In other words, you actually had to, to hardwire in content names and things like that to make it work. We're now in a very different place where you can create uh, a web interface or a web layer interface which can interact with a set of data below it. It costs an amazingly larger amount of money to maintain a website and a web interface than it does to maintain a data set. If you can treat them as being two slightly different things, which where one feeds the other, then you can, for, for one, in, from one perspective, either keep your costs in a more sensible place from a management perspective, but you can also, I think, look at it from the perspective of, if I want to set it free, if I want people to have access to this, if I want people to be able to reuse this material, why don't I just make it really easy for them to just come and download the stuff and build their own things around that, rather than um, uh, requiring them to always come through and use a web interface to get anywhere near the data? Why don't I just let them have access to that data? And we're starting to see that in the way that higher education is being mandated both in terms of open access for publications and also in terms of open access for research data. And we're going to have to deal with, from an academic perspective, I'm going to have to deal with those issues. And I sit on a whole bunch of committees where we're talking about these things all the time. Um, so it's, it, it's very hard from that perspective. But it's, it, that, was the, that, that to me was the step change that Will Noel achieved at the Walker Museum was, you could just, here is an FTP, here are some instructions. You just can just come and download two terabytes of our collections if you want to. Now, in response to that, when everyone goes, oh, wasn't that a terrible thing? He also says, look, those collections are on Flickr. They're on all these other sites. If you go into Google and search for medieval illuminated manuscripts, the Walker comes up higher ranked than the British Library because they've made their material more available, more seeable, more visible. So in some respects, that helps their recognition of their, their institution and will drive people, because people will still want to go and see these things. I don't think any of us, just because we've seen a poster of a you know, fabulously, fabulous quality poster of an artwork on the wall, aren't still going to want to see the original, because, you know, uh, in that sense. So I probably said more than I need to there. I don't know if anyone else has got any comments. Is that okay? Hi, uh, this is just an observation really, but hopefully opening up for discussion. Uh, I think it was Victoria um, earlier on that was talking about um, uh, why people 
generally don't ever um, sue. You're talking about risk management. Why uh, copyright holders, if their work is uh, made available to the public and they find out about it later, having not been told. Why they very rarely sue, why there's never any financial restitution. And you talked about reputation as um, something to consider in terms of risk on the side of the uh, people who are putting this information out. But it occurred to me that there's also reputation on the side of the people who own the copyrights. And they've got to consider this as well. It's something to be borne in mind. And it may speak to why it's, we should be more, uh, less risk averse because the, they aren't going to want to sue essentially because of their reputation. People these days want to be seen to be able to share data. They, they don't want to be heavy handed. They don't want to be seen as bullies. And I've seen numerous examples in my career where people have asked for stuff to be taken down, but they've never asked for financial restitution mm -hmm. because they don't want the sort of negative publicity associated with that. And maybe mm -hmm. that's something that could be borne in mind yeah. in the future. Oh, sorry, yeah, um, I'm Andrew James. I work for Scram, which some people in here might know. It's a big yeah. digital database. Yeah, absolutely, I agree. I think reputation exists on both sides. Um, and I think, I mean, one of the contributing factors to people not suing is the fact that it is so expensive and a lot of the time it just makes more sense to have a negotiated process whereby um, you know the cultural institution and the rights holder just sort out their differences that way rather than going down um, the route of litigation and yeah I can I can see that reputation would play a part on both sides. Can I be extremely cheeky and ask you to hand the microphone just to the people just in front of you. Charles Oppenheimer, Adrian Muir. Um, uh, I was just going to say, um, because I think both Charles and Adrian probably have a lot more experience of what happens uh, in those cases that never get to court, shall we say, and how those are um, sorted. Because this is one of our problems, isn't it, is that there isn't very much case law because they tend to get settled out of court in that sense. And I'm going to make you do, make you do some work. Yeah. Yep. Um, Charles Oppenheim. Um, the, these cases tend not to go to court, no. Uh, and um, one reason is, precisely as has been suggested, that uh, there's the reputational costs on both sides and neither side wants to take the risk, and so they will settle out of court, be a, uh, there might be compensation. But one story I'll say um, was involved a uh, educational institution called Greenwich College, not Greenwich University, but Greenwich College, which was a small FE college in south of London, which was caught infringing copyright, not in this area, but in photocopying books and articles. Um, and the way it was done, there were suspicions uh, by the publishers that this was going on. So they registered a, inverted commas, student on the course to observe what was going on. This student paid, uh, or rather the publishers paid good money for the student to register to be a accredited student, paid the fees. And it actually went to court, and um, uh, the court assessed the damages at, let's just say, I don't know the precise figure, but thousand pounds. And the bursar of the college was then interviewed and said publicly, well, we, we've got no problem. This student paid 2,000 pounds in fees, <laughs> never troubled any lecturer with submitting coursework or anything. Uh, <laughs> So we're a thousand pound in profit. And I thought that really was an attitude to copyright which wasn't uh, to be encouraged. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Fred Saunderson, uh, National Library of Scotland. Um, I'm curious about, Simon, you've talked about this at the end here, but it's been obviously a theme throughout an impact measuring the impact from an organizational perspective is what I'm interested in here. Um, there are different kinds of impacts that we can get from our collections has been discussed. The money is an easy thing to measure. Um, it's difficult for us to measure how much it costs us maybe to generate the impact of money coming in, but it's easy to measure the money that does come in. It's easy to measure how many people come and look at our website, how many people come through our door. It's very difficult to measure and then demonstrate value uh, to our paymasters. 
when people are using material entirely disconnected from us. And I'm wondering if there's anything to be said about how we might go about doing that. You're all looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants that? Go on then. Okay, Yo, this is obviously my, my thing, isn't it? Um, it it's, it's something, and maybe Joris might want to talk about this from Europeana's perspective as well. Um, it, it's something where where the blurring of the boundary between the things that, that, that you do as an organization and the things that people do with the content you custodial uh, responsibility as an organization um, start to become blurred and, uh, and difficult to measure. Um, my main piece of advice is just being purposeful. I don't necessarily think it's uh, uh, terribly important to um, assume that everything you're going to do is going to succeed and will drive wonderful things. But there is an awful lot of assumption built into um, the community. So one of the big assumptions is, is that being on Google Art Project is a really good thing to do. It costs an absolute fortune to be on Google Art Project to get the metadata in the form that they want it and to share it with them. And what do you get back? Very, very little. Um, I was talking to a, a particular small museum who was saying, look, you know, our art is being seen on, on Google Art Project and that means that this small indigenous art collection is being seen. And I'm saying, okay, how many trackbacks to your, to your museum do you get? And it was over a six month period, it was less than 100. So, you know, you have to, you know, rather than sort of just, just, just jumping in and saying, if, if everyone else is doing it or if you know, we put it on Google, that equals wonderfulness because it's, it's just great. It's about being purposeful about it and thinking about it in your planning. So thinking, how will this generate a benefit to my community? And in thinking about how will it generate a benefit to my community, you might think, well, while I'm thinking about how it would do that, I might want to think about how I would understand success. And that might be a way of measuring or it might be a way of um, just being able to, to make the statement, we did this, it was worth doing, whether there was a, a necessary financial activity. And it's about being creative around that. So um, we've, we've seen some really good examples you know, of, of people thinking, okay, well, how can I show that what we do with images is as meaningful as what the marketing department does for my institution? And so they started to measure how much print space their images are taking up when they're being used in the Sunday Times or in a magazine or in, in those areas and turning that into money because that's exactly what the marketing department does. It says, oh look, we got a big article about you in the middle of this Sunday spread and that would have cost you this much advertising if you try to do that. And so the imaging department for um, uh, a certain sort of museum said, okay, well we're going to measure how much of that was taken up by our images. And we're going to claim that as being our part of that marketing benefit. So that's a way of sort of showing an indirect monetization of the fact those images were out there in terms of a thing that's very valuable to, to a museum, which is brand recognition, you know, in that sense, you know, deciding to go to that museum rather than others. Other museums, if you look at the Powerhouse Museum in Australia, it is in the top 10 things you must do if you go to Sydney. It's a tiny little museum. Uh, it's ranked much higher than some of the big national museums which are based in Sydney as one of the top ten things to do and that's based on its, its social media profile and on all of the stuff it does online and the fact that it is very, very present in that space and those aspects. So you can look at it from that sort of aspect. But also then you get the really inspiring stuff. So there's a small um, set of public uh, libraries. I think it's in, I think it's in either Hungary or Czechoslovakia. Again, Joris can, can, can correct me. Where they're um, getting school children to come in at the weekends and build videos based on Europeana content which relates to uh, their family history or their, their, their place in their grandparents' time. And these are six, seven, eight year olds who are building videos out of Europeana CC0 content about the place in which they live. And, you know, that would melt the heart of the strongest politician who doesn't want to give you any money, you know, in that sense. Because those kids are also taking that experience back into school and saying to their school teachers, why aren't you using Europeana? 
because we're finding out through it from the public library. It's also doing that thing which is turning, which is really important that our physical spaces, our museums, libraries, archives, use the digital to become maker spaces, to become, to, to be part of that community uh, activity, to draw people into the spaces. And that's the other thing to say about copyright, is often people think that copy, think that digital is a way of people all accessing material at home on their screen. Actually, one of the things is, is that there's lots of things you can't do in that space because of copyright, but you can do it in your space. Because within your space, you're not handing it off to people, you're holding it still within your space. So you can have those Microsoft Surface tables, you can have people cutting stuff up and doing stuff in that space and building things in those areas. Because you have more control over that environment than just, just handing it out. So even if you are in a space where all your material is in copyright, absolutely everything you know, you're, you're working with is, is, is modern art and uh, is, is restricted by um, the, the, the copyright holders, uh, either the living artists or their estates, you can still do things in your spaces which transcend those things that you could do in the online space using digital materials which will still then add value back to that, whether that's through an educational perspective, whether that's through a perspective of building community and culture and understanding, or whether that's from some sort of social uh, and educational good around that. Does that help? Well, it's that perhaps you haven't factored in sufficiently that the impulse to litigation isn't always about loss of reputation, it's also about loss of potential or actual earnings. Um, I've done some work on derivative uh, literary texts, and there's a case there which actually did go to court, and that's uh, when J.K. Rowling, Scholastic, and Warner Brothers took the author, stroke, compiler, and publisher of the Harry Potter Encyclopedia to court in New York. And one of the defense arguments was, well, look, we had all this stuff up online, and J.K. Rowling didn't bother. In fact, she praised what we were doing, which ignored the point completely that when you go from offering a resource free online, which keeps interest in the characters and in the books, that's one thing. But when you seek to make money out of it that takes away from the potential earnings of J.K. Rowling, that's another thing, and that's when you get taken to court. So it's not just reputation, it's also, as I said, um, actual and potential loss of earnings that is an impulse to litigation. Margaret Haig from Intellectual Property Office. Um, I, this is slightly a different topic and maybe more appropriate for Megan, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know if anyone caught on the breakfast news this morning about the um, Royal Voluntary Service uh, project, which is just, um, they're just, well, a couple of weeks ago, I'll go back. A couple of weeks ago, I saw on the, um, on the BBC website um, that they were advertising about uh, um, coats being made from dog fur during the war. And this was something that was being put out. It was part of a campaign to raise money um, to digitize this archive of the what was the Women's Royal Voluntary Services, now the Royal Voluntary Service. And, they, and today they've announced that they've made their target. So obviously that kind of extra advertising um, and, uh, kind of paid off for them and they've now got the funds to, to go ahead. Um, they've also been made a UNESCO um, archive of import, I don't know what the technical term is, um, but I just wondered whether that's um, sort of an example of that kind of interface between the intangible, tangible, um, and also the, the sort of fundraising element, which might be something of wider interest um, for, for what people have been talking about, about raising that money for digitization. Is it actually about doing something quirky, like about knitting coats out of dog fur, um, uh, to actually capture the interest? to get people um, to actually contribute time or money um, into some of these projects to actually get them off the ground. 
Um, well, I'll just address a little bit. If I had the answer to that, I would probably have my own <laughs> start up here with that. But um, as far as intangible cultural heritage goes, uh, we were discussing a little bit earlier how uh, domestically, a lot of the time, we'll treat high art and monuments as culture and um, you know, not really recognize the domestic practices that we have that are traditions as heritage, right? So our heritage would be museums and symphonies and uh, printed art like this, whereas things like cheese rolling or dog fur coats would be something that would be interesting in, in, in a culture that is outside of the country, right? Um, but it's always a little bit about what is on the outside. So perhaps, yeah, maybe making it, um, emphasizing the sort of quirky histories and integrating that into um, the lexicology that we use around culture would be, would be one way to bring that into um, sharing the tangible and intangible space. And uh, maybe that will bring some funds into I, I was just going to say, this will take me very short time. Um, the British government should be congratulated, actually, because, um, uh, because the UNESCO Memory of the World um, activity led to a declaration, and the British arm of UNESCO and the government here in the UK have moved further than almost any other government in the world in endorsing and moving towards um, that UNESCO declaration. So I think we're doing quite a good job in, in that respect, I want to say thanks to the government for that. Well, I was wanting to uh, widen the discussion a bit, or can, perhaps nobody wants to, but uh, we could think about it. I mean, overall, what do we think the, Im the impact of digitization is on the finance of um, museums, uh, archives, and so on. I mean, when I first uh, sort of understood what digitization was, uh, which is essentially, uh, you know, barring glitches with copyright, turning um, goods into, or services, images, and so on, into public goods. Now, there's always a strong argument in economics uh, for public goods to be financed by the state. And I had a couple of uh, students working on this, and I said this is, you know, sort of open, open and shut case uh, for digitization, um, you know, to, to be financed by public uh, organizations. But of course, I now see that it's become so widespread, uh, and, uh, and, you know, um, but it has altered the balance. I'm particularly interested myself in performing arts. Now, I mean, at one time, opera was almost, you know, um, entirely dependent upon public subsidy or very, very high prices. And now uh, it's able to monetize uh, its, uh, itself way beyond anything anybody dreamt of. And that obviously has implications for public finance. So I don't know if anyone has ideas about this, but Maybe it's for the future, but uh, I, I think that hasn't really been discussed. Um. Actually, that's a big question to ask. Well, I'm a big girl, you know. 